Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Bishop Jennifer. Um, I, I appreciate everything you just said and I throw it right back to you. You all truly have one of the, and she can just put her head down if she wants to, but you have one of the rock star bishops of our church. Um, most other dioceses are actually jealous of Indianapolis <laughs> because you have Jennifer. <laughs> um, so what a joy to be with you. What a joy um, to, to just spend some time reflecting on your mission and what God may just be up to um, in, in Southern and Central Indiana and in all the places God sent you. So we're gonna start out with some prayer and um, we did have a lot of fun in October with our workshop. So I figure let's, let's come back to how we started in that one. Um, so even though we're not together, maybe we will do a little singing and dancing here. So, <laughs> so just join me if you will. This is the, the simplest, one of the simplest songs out there. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Well, now this little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Everybody sing this little light of mine. I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Everywhere I go, everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Well, now everywhere I go, I'm gonna let it shine. Everybody sing everywhere I go. I'm gonna let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Let it shine. Amen. Um, I'm sure my neighbors here in Harlem are like, what is going on in apartment 802 right now? <laughs> but, um, it's not the strangest thing going on in the city right now. Um, again, I welcome you. I thank you for welcoming me um, as we dive in this morning and, um, and just share some about how you are sharing and living the Jesus movement in the Diocese of Indianapolis. Um, I really did enjoy being with you in October and it feels in some ways like it was just yesterday and in other ways, like it was a world ago. Um, there have been so many more pandemic deaths since we spent that time together. There's been an election, albeit, um, well, there's, there's been voting since then. <laughs> we haven't yet confirmed an election yet. Uh, I truly believe that the mission that you have laid out is more important now than ever. And I am excited to explore this with you. Just as a refresher for everyone, you said that you as a diocese are called by Christ to welcome and witness in central and southern Indiana. Um, and you said that grounded in God's love and Christ you as a diocese would serve as beacons of Christ here in central and southern Indiana and beyond. You said that you would offer a generous invitation and welcome, that you would stand with vulnerable and marginalized peoples, um, and that you would transform systems of injustice. You said that you long to connect among Episcopalians, but also among your ecumenical interfaith partners and advocacy groups. Um, you said that you would develop clergy and laity in order to lead the church of today and tomorrow. Now that's a lot going on there. And those are some incredibly important pillars, um, some of the basics of what it means to be God's people. How will you live into all of that? There's only one way, hand in hand with Jesus Christ. I pray that you will ask him to inhabit you and that you will follow in his footsteps because Jesus is the one who showed us the way and grants us the power to do everything you've set your hearts on as a diocese. First, he gathered people and invited them to share. I'm just going to share this screen again so you can be looking at it. We're going to do some learning up in here. Jesus gathered people and invited them to dedicate their lives to his unselfish way of love, to be his beacons, his light, his body in the world. That's why I know that we can serve as beacons of Christ everywhere, 
especially where you are in central and southern Indiana. Jesus extended his arms of love to welcome people into intimate relationship, the relationship he already shared with our creator God and with the Holy Spirit. Now you get to jump in and invite and welcome people into loving, liberating, life-giving relationship with God and with each other. Jesus went wherever people suffered dis disenfranchisement and indignity. He went wherever you found what Howard Thurman called people with their backs against the wall. Jesus went and stood with them against the wall and on the cross. Christians can and should stand with the most marginalized and vulnerable people and work to transform unjust systems so that everyone has a chance to experience flourishing and wholeness and love. Jesus built networks. He connected anybody who shared in the shalom of God, whether they were prostitutes, tax collectors, Samaritans. He didn't care what your background was. He wanted to know if you were pointed toward the reign of God. We follow him and we connect with fellow Episcopalians, with partners of every faith tradition, with the advocacy and civic groups, all together pursuing what we understand as God's dream. And oh, how Jesus grew leaders. Come and follow me, he said, and I'll make you fishers of men. He took a ragtag group of misfits and rejects, and he made them the foundation of a revolutionary movement that is still changing the world. You better believe that now you can and you will develop clergy and laity who will lead the church of today and tomorrow. Diocese of Indianapolis, I absolutely believe, I truly believe that you will live out what you have dreamed together. Now briefly, let's reflect on what it would take for you to do that and how you might follow Jesus and really be his movement in central and southern Indiana and wherever God sends you as extension of his movement. So first off, let's actually explore for a while, just a moment even, what do we mean by Jesus movement? And I wanna invite you into the chat box now. Feel free to just write in what comes to mind for you when you hear that phrase, Jesus movement. Let's just get him firing away, go for it. Jesus movement, ah, expressions of love, yes. More love, radical welcome, hey now. <laughs> living out the dream of God, love and justice and radical equity, taking risks, inclusion, the call to be changed, making this old world new, amen. Upsetting the status quo, radical acceptance, living on the outskirts, helping other people, getting unstuck, amen, Mary Slinsky. <laughs> moving, moving, going somewhere. Um, feeding people with food for our bodies and souls. There are so many ways that we can understand what it means to be Jesus's movement. And feel free to keep filling that box. Um, you might end up with a word cloud when we're done with this. <laughs> and that would be beautiful. Um, what I want to suggest to you is that a way of understanding what it is for us to be part of this Jesus movement is that the Jesus movement is the ongoing community of people who follow Jesus into loving, liberating, life-giving relationship with God, there's a vertical, with each other, there's a horizontal, and with all of creation wrapping around. That's a Jesus movement and that's what we are part of. Because Jesus launched a movement. He didn't just launch a building or launch a new ritual or an institution. He said he wanted us to be a part of his movement, to be people of his way. You said you want to be beacons of Christ. Well, beacons carry out this movement, the Jesus movement. We embody his life and his purpose in the world. And especially right now, y'all, America desperately needs serious followers of Jesus who will practice his loving way in the world. 
I have never seen our country as broken as she is right now. And I imagine most of you haven't either. But you know, Jesus was no stranger to brokenness. He stepped right up to it. He named it. He walked with the have-nots and the haves and with everyone in between. Jesus gathered up a diverse group of people in order to have them share a radical life of love, love for God, love for one another, love for all of creation. He formed an alternative community, a beloved community where everyone rises up into the full stature of Christ. Feel free to sit up a little straighter in your seats or wherever you are right now and rise up into the stature of Christ. That's what he invites us into so that we can heal and teach as he did and draw people home to God as he did. We follow in the footsteps of Jesus and his movement. That's our legacy. And we do it especially as Episcopalians. Um, we said so in our catechism. Aha, you didn't see that coming, did you? <laughs> um, in our catechism, the question is asked, what is the mission of the church? And wherever you are right now, even if you're muted, just read this out loud. The mission of the church is to restore all people to unity with God and each other in Christ. That mission is not just a nice statement. It's the heart of a movement, a Jesus movement. And we are the Episcopal branch of that movement, following Jesus into liber and to loving, liberating and life-giving relationship with God, each other and creation. Amen. <laughs> Make your neighbors nervous. Feel free to say amen real loud. <laughs> um, so I see us living into this movement in three distinct ways. And they're ways that are completely um, covered in your mission. Discipleship, in our evangelism, and in our reconciliation. Now, first, discipleship. I think this is what you mean when you promise to serve as beacons of Christ. We said it in the workshop last month, and I'll say it again now. Y'all, we can't be beacons shining with Christ's light and love unless we are following him and growing in his love and have his light in us. There is not another way. How do we grow in that love? Um, actually believe that there's nobody better for my money than um, Susan Hope for naming what it looks like when we come alive with this love of Jesus. I'm just going to read this for you. She says, at the heart of apostolic spirituality lies one great, central, bewildering, joyful, life-giving discovery that Jesus is alive. Feel free to just say those words again, wherever you are right now. Jesus is alive. I can see your lips. I see if you're saying it or not. <laughs> Jesus is alive. This central conviction that Jesus is alive is woven into the heart and mind of the apostolic person. She is branded with it, marked with it. It is burned into the psyche. It is entirely and utterly transformative. And those who receive this conviction will never be the same again. An apostolic community will be one that is branded with, burned with the conviction that Jesus is alive. And this conviction may be held deeply and quietly, or it may bubble joyfully and exuberantly on the surface, but it must be there. Hmm. God loves us so completely. And in Jesus, God draws near in order to invite us to love God and to be loved by God, to be wrapped up in this love and to be so fully inhabited by this love of God that we can't help but have it change us. And we can't help but have it pour out into the world around us. Without that conviction, without that spirit fire smoldering in us, we're really just selling church. We're doing marketing for our buildings. So how do you grow that fire of love, that deep, deep consciousness, so that you have that smoldering fire in you? 
Well, the ancients would call this practicing the presence of Christ. That's how we become those beacons of Christ. For us as Episcopalians, we've said that we want to grow in this way, in particular, as we share in the way of love. These are seven practices that enable us to follow in the footsteps of Jesus and to really um, feel connected to him, to feel his love lighting the flame of sacred love on the mean altar of our hearts. We do this whenever we turn toward God, pause and listen and choose to follow Jesus. We grow in Christ whenever we learn um, and read scripture and receive God's word. We grow whenever we pray, whether it's corporate prayer or personal prayer. We grow as we worship, dwelling deeply with God and one another. We grow in the love of God and in the, the presence of Jesus as we bless others, as we listen and minister and just hold one another for the journey. And we grow in Christ as we go out and heal and make justice in his name. And we certainly grow in Christ as we rest, trusting that God is God and we are not and don't ever have to be. Amen. <laughs> There's so many ways for us to grow in the love of God. We're not trying to manufacture or create it. We're just awakening and dwelling in it, following his way so that we love as he loved and live as he lived. If we live with Jesus' love at the center of us. <laughs> it might look something like this tattoo. This is my arm. <laughs> um, this is actually one of the first times I've used my own tattoo as a slide um, presentation, but I think it works. Because what you see here is the spiral with Jesus' love at the center, Jesus' resurrection power at the center. And then you see this horizontal and vertical axis what I imagine is that when God's love is really inhabiting us, fully alive in us, that swirl, swirl at the center, then it moves out as evangelism, moves out as we help others to grow a love with God, that vertical movement. And it moves out in the form of reconciliation as we grow love for one another, especially across boundaries. So first, we experience um, this mission of God and we live this mission of God as we practice evangelism. I think this is what you mean when you say that you will offer a generous invitation and welcome. That's evangelism. Now don't panic. I know that a lot of people hear the word evangelism and they get really nervous. Feel free to put into the chat box right now what comes to mind for you when you think evangelism. It might be something like this. <laughs> the church lady, church lady wagging her finger. Isn't that special? Um, I think I did that way too well. <laughs> it must be the cat eye glasses. Um, but uh, whatever it is that comes to mind for you when you think evangelism, just put it into the chat box. Just let it go. Be like, this is our relief. Street preachers, sharing God's unconditional love, but also being fundamentalists. Ah, there's so much going on. The tents. Um, we're over here. We're back here, we're over here, we're back here. We have really mixed feelings about evangelism. Uh, what I want to encourage you around is that Episcopal evangelism doesn't have to be the kind of thing where someone's trying to change you. Episcopal evangelism is not telling people what they don't know and giving them what they're missing. Um, it's not saving people from the fiery pit of hell. And Episcopal evangelism is not about filling up pews and getting them to come inside to be with us. Hmm. I'm gonna say that one again. Episcopal evangelism is not about getting them to come and be with us. Episcopal evangelism starts with seeking. We seek, we name, we celebrate Jesus's loving presence. We seek him in the stories of all people we look around to see where is the good news active in the world, in our lives and in the lives of the people around us. And then when we see it, we name it, we celebrate it. And then there's invitation. And I just saw that word in the chat box and it's in your mission. There's inviting people to have even more. 
we offer a generous invitation, a generous welcome to people and say, you want more of life with God? I'd love to walk with you as we both develop that closer relationship with God. When you are practicing Episcopal evangelism, you are noticing what God is doing in the communities around you. But you're not just noticing and you're not just doing things. You're using your words. And I want to especially pause with this because I know that we Episcopalians prefer um, maybe St. Francis's definition of evangelism, proclaiming the gospel at all times, but use words if necessary. We really don't want to use the words. Time's up, y'all. <laughs> It's time to use the words, because right now, when people see us doing loving things, they don't associate that with Christianity. They just think you're a nice person. If you want people to know that it's Jesus who, who moves you into the world as a force for love, if you want them to know that you see Jesus in them, you have to use his name. You have to use the words. Now, we used to do this. Um, at the church that I um, worked with a team to found in Boston, The Crossing. We would go out after church on Thursday nights. Um, we met for Thursday night church. And um, after Eucharist and everything else, still in my collar, I would go out and um, go with my congregation and we would go to a dance club. And we would dance and we would smile and we would celebrate life. And we were just glowing again. We had just come from Eucharist. People would come up to us and ask, what are you on? <laughs> Seriously. Um, and people were always asking me, are you a minister? And I'm like, no, it's a turtleneck. Of course I'm a minister. <laughs> um, and then of course they had to ask, why are you here? And that gave me an opening to say, God is here in this dance club. I see God all over the place. I see liberation, I see hope, I see life, I see transformation. I see community, I see healing, I see new life. You wanna talk some more about God? Because God is here. People were so enlivened by that conversation and I have to believe that God did something with that invitation. That's an evangelism I can get on board with where Jesus and the Holy Spirit are the primary actors and we're just following their lead. I'm not bringing Jesus to anybody I'm putting on my special X-ray glasses or maybe my cross-ray glasses and I can see Jesus everywhere. Um, I see him whenever I'm asking um, for the words to, to, to love people. I see him in their lives and I'm just blessed to find him there. It's kind of the model that we see in Acts 26 or Acts chapter eight, verses 26 to 40 that wonderful interaction between um, Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. Uh, and I just wanna visit that for a moment. There we go. In this story, Philip is just minding his own business. He doesn't know what's going on. And then the spirit grabs his attention and says, Philip, you see that chariot over there? Go up to it. Philip goes and he discovers a eunuch. Now, mind you, a eunuch would have been the last person to embody holiness, the last person. He was someone with a castrated body. He was unclean. He wasn't even allowed to come all the way into the temple. Philip was sent by the spirit up to this man and he was told, be with him. And so Philip went, he goes to the chariot and discovers the eunuch is reading scripture, this eunuch was spiritual, but not religious. <laughs> so they began to talk about scripture. They talk about Jesus. And the eunuch discovers all these amazing ways that his story intersects with Jesus's story. That's what Philip helps him to discover. And as soon as he gets it, the eunuch is like, what's to prevent me from being baptized? Now, the truth is that there were so many reasons he wasn't supposed to be baptized. <laughs> Philip didn't go there. Instead, they went together to the waters. They proclaimed holiness in that moment. And I believe that they were both baptized and blessed that day. That is the kind of evangelism I hope our whole church can get excited about. Um, 
the kind of evangelism where we walk into spaces where God is least likely to show up and we pay attention. Notice what God is already up to. Open our mouths to name what we see, the holiness around us. Express wonder, express gratitude, express praise to God for what you see in the people around you and their stories. And then invite them to take it deeper, to develop spiritual intimacy with God, and in time to grow with a Christian community that's dedicated to deepening that relationship and living into God's dream together. I see that in your mission. I see that in you. Now there's something else that's urgent that you've proclaimed in your mission and that is that you will stand with the vulnerable and the marginalized and transform systems of injustice. What that sounds like to me is justice and reconciliation. So let's talk about that for just a little bit. Justice and reconciliation. Now, reconciliation is not just being nice to your neighbors, and it's not just, can't we all just get along? Reconciliation actually is about justice. It is dismantling oppressive systems, pulling down walls, committing to the long work of repair and healing what is broken in us and around us. As a church, we have too long embodied the racial and socioeconomic brokenness of our society. You know it and I know it. And there are so many ways that we recognize it on the East Coast, in the South, in the Midwest, on the West Coast. We as Episcopalians, good Lord, we have been the church of the slaveholders. We have been the church of the industrialists, the church of the owning and managing class. And we are to this day especially when it comes to liturgy and culture. Episcopalians are overwhelmingly identified with English culture and with upper class elite values of order, perfection, and sober bearing. Those mores, that, I'm gonna use this word now, anglophilic, hello. <laughs> Uh, we practice Anglo Anglophilia, the love of England as a church in the way that we hold this formal classy posture. All of that is a part of our DNA and it travels across region, across race and class. Um, that's the reason why there's so few people of color and young people and poor people in our churches. It's because from day one in America, we demanded that non-elites leave their culture at the door and assimilate to Anglo-American upper-class values and aesthetics. They had to love what we as a church loved if we invited them at all. So what do you do with this? What do you do with the history of being the church of empire? How do you work toward a renewed vision? In 2017, we as a church said, that we would become beloved community. We said, we don't wanna be what we have been. We want to be what God has dreamt. We said that we wanted to be what you find in that wonderful prayer for the human family. Um, and y'all know this prayer. We said that we wanted to be a community where arrogance and hatred no longer infect our hearts. We wanna be a community where we are united in bonds of love and where walls no longer separate us. We said that we wanna be a community where people of every race and nation and kind work together toward the common flourishing of the earth. We said we wanted to be a community where your flourishing, your health, your, your life matters as much to me as my own. Imagine if that was the way America worked right now. We said that we would be a community where justice and wholeness for my group matters as much to me as for your group. Our model for this, my friends, is Jesus himself. We said earlier that he formed the original beloved community where insiders and outsiders are equally cloaked in Christ. Jesus was the one who gave us this image, this image of powerful community 
that heals and teaches and loves and prays in order to knit the world back into wholeness again. No, I don't know how to do that except by the power of the spirit. And I'm glad, I'm grateful, Lord, I'm grateful that Jesus sent the spirit that day on Pentecost and that the spirit is still coming to be with us, still animating us as communities so that we can love each other, love our neighbors, love strangers, love our enemies. I need that spirit right now. Maybe you do too. If we got that gift of the spirit and it's already there, she is already waiting. What might the spirit make possible among us? What would it look like if you truly stood with the vulnerable and marginalized and transformed systems of injustice in the way of Jesus? Again, we as a church have, we've had something to say about this. Um, so I just want to pull it up and we can do a little bit more of this learning together. We've said that we want to become beloved community now, which is a deepening of our commitment to beloved community, but it acknowledges the urgency of the moment. If you really take the spirit into you and live this justice and healing call, you would be truth telling, telling the truth about our churches and race. You would be seeking justice and repairing institutions around us especially the ones that have been broken because of um, criminal injustice, because of police brutality, and because of the disparate suffering of people of color due to pandemic. If you truly, truly get inhabited with the spirit and live Jesus's way, you would be healing the wounds of systemic racism as they live in each one of us, and they do. You would be engaging in formation and in training anti-racism training sacred ground circles. We would see that in the Diocese of Indianapolis. And I know we already do in a lot of your congregations. Now there are grants and there are web resources galore so that you can do these things. But there's also a foundational practice that I want to lift up right now. A practice that underlies our work in evangelism and reconciliation. And it is this the fine revolutionary art of deep listening. Listening to each other's deep pain, to our deep truths, to our deep humanity. I believe this is the only thing that will save us and make us all free. My model for this revolutionary practice, as you see with this icon, is Jesus. You know, most people think of Jesus and they picture this holy man who just went around teaching and preaching and um, doing a lot of talking. But I think if you were there at the time, you would have seen Jesus doing a lot of listening, listening to children, listening to elders, listening to the poor and to the rich, to Jews and to Gentiles. I'm convinced that actually it was Jesus' listening that made it possible for him to grow a community of love across all the deep divides in his time. I can see him now. I see Jesus right now gathering a crew of misfits and reaching out his hand and saying to them, I need you to receive each other as if you are receiving God. I need you to listen to each other as if you are hearing God. There is power in this kind of deep, deep listening. There is power in this listening. It is spirit power. And I hope that at some point in your life, you've experienced it. I'm convinced the structures that diminish black lives and brown lives and native lives, the structures that diminish poor lives and women's lives and LGBTQ lives, these structures, these systems will not fundamentally change. We will not be free unless we are doing this kind of brave listening. Listening as if something true and holy is coming out of the mouth of that other person. How I wish that we could create spaces, spaces where everybody gets to answer four questions as a part of our deep listening. 
These are the questions. Where does it hurt? What have you lost? What do you love? What do you dream? Imagine sitting with these questions intentionally in one-to-ones and small groups. It actually doesn't have to be that complicated. You could start with, with small groups during your Zoom coffee hour. Hold out these questions, invite people into breakout groups. Explain that we're practicing humility and curiosity with each other. Church should be our training ground where we learn to be healers and reconcilers and lovers in the name of Jesus, where we learn to be the beacons of Christ's light and love and hope, where we learn to be the ones that God has called us to be in our communities. So friends, this is the game change. This is what your mission is laying out and driving you toward. It's not just about learning more about Jesus. It's not just about worshiping Jesus. It's about being Jesus's body, his movement in the world. We're not just the Episcopal church. We are the Episcopal branch of a Jesus movement. We're not just purveyors of beautiful liturgy and ancient roots and inclusive theology. We have a mission grounded in God's love in Christ. We can and will serve as beacons of Christ. We can and will offer generous invitation and welcome. We can and will stand with the most vulnerable and join in bending the arc of the universe toward justice. We can and will connect with people dedicated to wholeness and shalom. We can and will develop leaders who grow other leaders in the name of God. This is what we do. We are the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement. And in fact, right now, wherever you are, just join me in saying that we are, we are the Episcopal branch of the Jesus movement. Jesus movement. I feel like I heard you. I did hear some of you. Amen. (laughs) (laughs) We are embodying his love and his life and his truth in everything we do. I wish you every blessing as we walk this Jesus way together and change this world. Amen. 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 Ooh. Ooh. Right? <laughs> I need a moment. <laughs> oh, Canon Stephanie Spellers, thank you. You have blessed us up. Mm. And I, there were many amens going on while you spoke, as um, Ken and Kristen and I thought. Has she been in our rooms this whole year? <laughs> Just. I've been praying with you. That's what oh. I've been doing. I'm channeling. I'm channeling oh. you and your leadership. You all have such an amazing mission and vision, and it is a blessing to be able to, to just hold it back out and reflect it back to you, because sometimes that's what it takes for us to see what God is calling us to. Um, may I offer a blessing to you, actually? Can I do that? I would be honored. Thank you. Yay! This is a blessing for all of you. Um, it's actually a blessing that I wrote for the end of my new book, Church Cracked Open, but it feels like it applies in this moment, especially to you. So Diocese of Indianapolis, may the spirit of God draw you out onto the wilderness road. May she send you chasing after chariots beyond all reason or propriety. May she bring you to dark skinned eunuchs and Samaritan woman, and young ones who dream wild dreams. And may they receive you into their homes and their worlds so that you might teach and convert one another. And may you enter the waters of baptism together and die and rise in Christ together in the name of the Creator and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.